Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, I'm Dharma City, and uh, we're in our Padmasandhava series in Dharma Night. Dharma Chandra uh, gave us a, a great introduction to Padmasandhava last week and uh, really evoked the figure of Padmasandhava, which we have on the shrine, and talked about some of the symbols and meaning of the symbols of Padmasandhava. And also kind of sketched in um, a little bit about the, the life and liberation, the history, the life story of Padmasambhava as well. So carrying on from uh, that introduction last week, um, I'm going to focus on uh, an aspect of uh, the life story of Padmasambhava, which is um, it's to do with, it's a very important part of his uh, life story, it's to do with the um, it being invited to Tibet to uh, help tame the demons that were stopping the building of the first Buddhist monastery in Tibet. And it's full of rich uh, symbolism, rich imagery. And uh, we're going to see if we can make some sense of it in terms of our own spiritual lives. The Life and Liberation uses a lot of, it's kind of, it's a mixture of history and a mixture of myth. So it's in time. It's also outside time as well, so to speak. It sort of blurs the boundaries between history and myth. And uh, it's a bit like reading a kind of dream. It's a bit like reading a waking dream. Uh, it's probably the best way to um, relate to it. Um, I was thinking a bit about um, a really popular TV series. I think it was in the 80s called Twin Peaks. There's probably a lot of people who are too young to remember it, but it was <laughs> by David Lynch. And... Uh, I used to love that when, when I was younger and it was kind of had that quality of a kind of waking dream. So if you ever get the chance to see a David Lynch, Twin Peaks or some of his other films even have got that quality to them, a very kind of blurring of uh, every day and something quite deep and outside of time mythic. Um, it's a bit odd in a certain sense, here we are, we're 21st century Buddhists and we have this um, figure from 8th century Tibet, a famous teacher from 8th century Tibet. And you could be forgiven for um, thinking, you know, what has something from so long ago, from such a different culture, got to do with the modern world? Um, you know, Tibet what is, was a, a magical culture. Um, and as we all know, the modern world is kind of... Um, left behind uh, some of that affinity with magical culture. We went in a different direction and the modern culture in the West has sort of become pretty much the culture all over most of the world these days, isn't it? But So you could be forgiven for wondering, you know, has it got, has Pamasamava got any real relevance to, you know, 21st century Buddhists? We're quite, you know, we've kind of, we've kind of went on a we kind of veered away from those sort of magical worlds, except, of course, in films like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, maybe even Star Wars and things like that. Um, so before I go into uh, some of the, um, the kind of magical world of Padmasambhava a little bit, bear in mind I've not got a lot of time. We've only got half an hour or so, so it's, it's not going to be massively in-depth. I'll do what I can. Uh, I thought it would just be good to... Um, just remind ourselves of why Padmasambhava is kind of part of Tri Ratna. Uh, and I think we have to recognise that Padmasambhava is massively important for our founder and teacher, Sangharachita Bhante, as we call him. Um, I'll just read you this paragraph from uh, Face, Facing Like Kanchen Junga, which is one of the volumes of uh, Sangharachita's memoirs, which are if you haven't read his memoirs, they're well worth reading because it's packed full of fascinating stories. You get to hear Bhante's accounts of meeting many, you know, really fascinating spiritual people in India. And a lot of the Tibetans, of course, got forced out of Tibet by the Chinese invasion and ended up as refugees in India. So Bhante had a lot of contact with Tibetan Buddhists, some of the, uh, the most highest... Tibetan Buddhists of the time Bansi had contact with and are his teachers. Anyway, in 1950, um, 
and he was in a monastery, not in Kalimpong, where he was living at the time, but in Darjeeling. And he saw a statue. It would have been something kind of like this image, but in statue form of Padmasambhava. And uh, he says this, he said, Though I had never seen the figure of Padmasambhava before, it was familiar to me in a way that no other figure on earth was familiar to me. <coughs> familiar and fascinating. It was as familiar as my own self, yet at the same time infinitely mysterious, infinitely wonderful and inspiring it was to remain. Indeed, from then on, the figure of the precious Guru, Guru Rinpoche, was to occupy a permanent place in my inner spiritual world. I find this paragraph remarkable, uh, I, and I don't actually know quite what to make of it. It seems to be saying that um, Sangharachita, um, even though this is the first time he's seen Padmasambhava, it seems to be saying that somehow there was a deeper recognition, there's a, a relationship with Padmasambhava that somehow outside of his ordinary life, growing up in London, getting, uh, you know, um, in the Second World War, getting taken to India, wandering and becoming a Buddhist monk in India, and then ending up in the north part of India where he starts to have contact with Tibetan Buddhism. This is in the 40s, 50s and 60s, well before the hippie, uh, you know, trail started in the 60s. Uh, it suggests to me that there was some, some kind of connection, I don't know what to say, from a past life, but he's recognising something about Padmasambhava instantly, immediately, something incredibly important, incredibly powerful. And I think we have to bear in mind that this <coughs> is why we have Padmasambhava in our movement, because it's an important aspect of Bansi's own spiritual life, his own spiritual journey. Uh, and it comes out, I think, the flavour of that in this particular paragraph. Um, in 1962, Bansi was <coughs> formally initiated into the sadhana practice of Padmasambhava by one of his teachers, Kachi Rinpoche, <coughs> and, has, and, and Padmasambhava remained a very important figure in his life and therefore in the life of Tri Ratna and therefore either directly or indirectly in the lives of the order. Um, <coughs> Sangharaj had six Tibetan teachers and five of those, or five of the six Tibetan teachers were what we call Nyingmapa and that means that they revere and uh, hold of central importance Padmasambhava in their spiritual life. So again you can see the Padmasambhava influence on Bhante. And if you ever get a chance to read Bhante's memoirs, it can be fascinating to read about his meetings with his Tibetan teachers. They're often deeply authentic people. They're coming from a very deep uh, spiritual experience. They're sometimes unconventional, unpredictable as well. And for me, that has some of the qualities of Padmasambhava, that deep unconventional, unpredictable, totally themselves kind of quality. That's what Bhante was meeting when he met his teachers in Tibet quite often. So uh, for me, Padmasambhava is a kind of Buddhist magician. Um, that's what I see when I see Padmasambhava. He's like a kind of Buddhist Gandalf, you know, if you're familiar with <laughs> The Lord of the Rings, or uh, a kind of Buddhist Merlin, or maybe a, a kind of Buddhist Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, he's got that kind of quality. I know that sort of might trivialise it a bit, but trying to find connections with what we're familiar with um, is, is not always is not always straightforward. Because as I was saying, we're not exactly a magical culture. Our our magician energy in our culture in the West seemed to flow very much into science a, a few hundred years ago. And we made incredible technological progress as a result. But it's a very particular expression of the magician energy through science. But I always get the impression, culturally, we long for the other side of the magician archetype, which is to do with consciousness, which is to do with understanding the depths of the mind. And uh, I think that comes out uh, in, our, in, in Hollywood films, you know. 
we want, we still sort of hanker after the magician in our lives, but the only way we can connect with it is maybe through figures like Gandalf, through figures like Harry Potter, through figures like Obi-Wan Kenobi, because we don't really have many outlets for the magician in our culture in that sort of inner life consciousness going into the depths of the mind. Um, and I think that's why Padma Sambha is important to Bante, <coughs> but also important in Sri Ratna and probably to many of us who are kind of looking for, if you like, initiation into the depths of our mind. And this is something that Buddhism and Sri Ratna and the path that we have uh, can offer, is that uh, going deeper into the, um, the depths of our mind. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think Cambridge, in a certain sense, is a sort of, um, it's got affinities with the magician, actually, it's the magician archetype, um, obviously through the university. Um, you know, um, magicians are all about changing your paradigm, yeah, they change your perception of things. You know, and if you think about, um, like, Newton, Isaac Newton came to Cambridge, didn't they, and... He discovered, as it were, gravity, and these sort of discoveries change the way we see the world, change the way we relate to the world. DNA was um, discovered in a pub near King's College. Uh, that totally changed our world, the discovery of DNA. Um, Stephen Hawking, who probably many of us would have seen around Cambridge in his you know, electric wheelchair, totally blew our minds with his, uh, you know, discoveries about time and black holes and space and stuff. And there's lots and lots of other examples of that in Cambridge University. It's very creative. It tracks, if you like, the magician uh, qualities. And the magician is always about um, changing the paradigm. And Padma Samva is, in a way, the ultimate magician, I would say, because he uh, helps us to change the most important paradigm of all, which is to change the mind from the unenlightened mind or the samsaric mind to the awakened mind. He's the ultimate magician. That's his magic. So, yeah, he's a magician, but not in the ordinary sense, although there's affinities with, uh, <clears throat> with um, uh, you know, ordinary magic, if you like, or unenlightened magic. But he's really about saying, you know, I'm here, to help you transform your consciousness, to help you transform your mind from the unenlightened mind to the awakened mind, yeah? That's what he's about. So let's have a look at the, um, the parable uh, for tonight. So as I was saying, yeah, it's, um, it's going to be looking at that element of... Um, um, trying to build a monastery in Tibet. So the king of Tibet wants to build a monastery in Tibet. And initially he invites a, a very good Buddhist monk called Shantarachita. He's a scholar, he's very committed, he's very ethical, very sincere. And uh, so he comes, accepts invitation, he comes to Tibet to help the king. And him and his team, they, um, they start to build the monastery. So they're doing that obviously during the day and at night tired they go to bed and at night time um, the local demons, the local spirits of Tibet don't like the monastery, they don't like the fact there's a monastery being built in Tibet and they start to dismantle it, they start to take it down. So that when, they, when Shantarachita and his team wake up in the morning they see the monastery has been has been dismantled, sabotaged, taken down. And they try again and again and again. And each night, the, uh, whatever they build is dismantled. So um, <clears throat> it's interesting because, um, you know, Tibet is seen in those days as being a kind of barbaric land. It's a barbaric and civilised land. And in a way, our minds can sometimes have that side to it. They've got sides to it that are not, uh, not um, in tune, shall we say, not supportive of the Dharma. And um, <clears throat> it's interesting, this whole area of, um, you know, building something during the day and then at night it being taken down. 
because we're all a bit like Shantarakshita, this monk that's been tasked with building a monastery in an inhospitable land. We're all a bit like that. Um, we're well intentioned. We're sincere. Um, we, you know, we've got New Year coming up. It's the time of making New Year's resolutions, isn't it? And, um, you know, we want to go to the gym, we want to lose weight, we want to get on better with the mother-in-law, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we set the intentions. We know we need to change, but um, we, we don't make it. We, we end up giving up. The, uh, the resolutions, the New Year's resolutions don't, don't happen. So we kind of know what that's like. Shantaraksha trying to build a monastery in Tibet is similar to us trying to keep our New Year's resolutions. We've got good intentions to change, but something in us prevents us, blocks the change. And this is what uh, is known as the demons, you know, you could say these are what are known as the demons. So the demons, the spirits that don't want the monastery in Tibet, there's parts of us that have got that quality. They don't want, uh, they don't want to, they don't want to build a monastery. You could say the monastery is us trying to build our Buddhist life, yeah, within ourselves. It's like trying to have meaning and value in our lives, having that in our psyches. But something in us, other parts of us, if you like, don't want that and, and sabotage it. So demons are all these forces that don't go along with our good intentions, yeah. So to make our lives meaningful, uh, we need to recognise that uh, good intentions are not enough, yeah. They're not enough. They're positive, but they, they, they're not enough. We have to have um, a new kind of approach. And that approach needs to take into account all of us. Yeah, it needs to take into account all of us. And that includes the messy parts, the shadow parts, the difficult parts. Um, having good intentions is, is, you can make a lot of progress with, don't get me wrong, you can make a lot of progress with good intentions. But at some point, uh, difficulties might happen. And that's the, and, and, and that's the point where more experienced people in the Sangha might say to you, you need a different approach, you know, you need to, you need to start changing your paradigm. And this is where I think Pama Samava can come in. He's, he's, he's got that magician quality to find that new paradigm that takes into account all of us, including the mess, including the darkness, including the parts that sabotage what we want to do. So Shantarakshita, if you like, is an image of good intentions, but Pamasamva is is um, is an is a new ideal that takes into account all of us. Yeah. And sh to be fair, in the story, Shantarakshita realizes that he can't do it. Yeah, he realizes that he can't build the monastery, and he goes to the king and he's honest about it and he says that to the king, I can't do it. And that honesty is quite important, you know, not, he's not blaming things, he's not, um, you know, deflecting or anything like that. He's, he's taking responsibility, he's ethical about it, he's recognising that he can't do it. And he recommends the king of Tibet that they, he invites Padmasambhava. He thinks Padmasambhava can do it. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, it's interesting because sometimes when we set off on the spiritual path, we don't always know exactly how it's going to go. Yeah, we we don't we sort of don't always know exactly what we're asking for. It's so personal the spiritual life. You know, we imagine it might be positive all the time. We imagine it will be just you know um, deeper and deeper meaning and pleasure. But there is a challenge to the spiritual life. I don't want to put people off, you know, and stuff like that, because it is amazing as well. But it is, it's a real, it's a very real thing, practicing the spiritual life. You have, you, you will kick into some uh, painful stuff at times, and we've all got it, you know. And that has to be included in our spiritual life as well. I remember um, back in 19... 97, 1997, it was just uh, the year before I got ordained, it was in 1998. I was ordained with Sundra in 1998, we were on the same course together at Guguloka in Spain. And um, just before, uh, I got my invitation, yeah, 
and, um, and then it was like, God, this is getting real, you know. It was like, that was my first, opened the letter, great, I've got my invite. That's what I've been working for towards for years, very intensively, going on retreats, involving myself in the Sangha and all the activities and study and practice. Um, finally got my invite. And shortly after I had this dream, and it was a kind of dream about getting ordained, maybe not surprising given I'd just been invited for ordination, but strangely I was getting ordained out in New <coughs> out in Newmarket Road, just out there actually, in the dream. And uh, I was getting ordained by a Dharma Charini, who uh, used to be based in Cambridge, Dharma Chandra, remember her, Vara Dakini, she was called French, very... Um, very strong Pamasamva person, actually. She used to do these incredible Pamasamva festivals here at the centre. Um, she took her spiritual life very, very seriously. Uh, she had uh, a sort of <coughs> Padmasamva like quality about her, I used to feel. And uh, she was very, um, very passionate about Padmasamva. And anyway, in this dream, she was, she was ordaining me. And as, and as you know, when you get ordained, you get given a kesa, you know, a nice white kesa symbolising purity, yeah? And, uh, but in this dream, I wasn't being given a white kesa. Uh, strangely enough, Varadakini had a black kesa. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'm getting ordained with a black kesa. <laughs> uh, so anyway, she put the kesa around my neck. And uh, then she said, I guess you want to know what your, what your name is. And of course, when you're, you know, when you're working towards um, ordination, getting given a new name is quite a big thing. Um, it's a new identity. It's got a lot of meaning to it. And of course, it's something you're not in control of. Something, somebody else is giving you that name. So in the stream, I was like, you know, anticipating. I was like, I wonder what the name's going to be. This is, you know, this is going to be interesting. And she said, your order name is, and she paused, and she said, demon. Your order name is demon. And then I woke up. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what, what, what sort of dream was this? You know, just being ordained with a black case, uh, being called demon. <laughs> uh, it was a really strange dream, which has obviously stayed with me, you know, all these years uh, since I had it. And, you know, what to make of that? I mean, this is the, uh, you know, the sort of dream world that Pamasamba is famous for. You can't, you, I mean, you can't exhaust what the meanings might be. Black Kesa, is that to do with, you know, all the, you know, purity is an interesting one, isn't it? So white symbolising purity, black, was that suggesting looking at the darkness, the things that might not be, uh, you know, uh, facing perhaps? Or was it something else, you know? Um, uh, black is a, a colour in our culture of, of funerals and death. Was it kind of suggesting an element of, um, you know, when you get ordained, they, they, they talk about it being a sort of spiritual death, yeah. letting go of your old identity and, um, you know, uh, taking on a new identity. It's a new way of life. Or was it something a bit alchemical you know, the, uh, the, the black in alchemy is called the negredo, and that's when things start to decay, things start to um, fall apart. But it's seen as a positive thing, because when things start to decay and fall apart, it allows something new to come into being. But then what about the whole thing about the, the name, demon? We've got a very interesting, uh, you know, history, haven't we? We're a sort of post-Christian culture, you could say. <coughs> We've got all this, uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, this sort of associations with demon. But demon is a Christian word. It's actually the Greek word, is diamond. It's actually much more positive. It's kind of like a, it's like the muse of, um, um, you know, poets. It's like a creative force uh, in one's life, but it's also quite earthy at the same time, you know. But for some reason, over the centuries, it became seen as being quite uh, threatening, you know. Anyway, but what, one of the things about the dream is, was, is when you start to go deeper in your spiritual life, you can touch into what you might stirring up, if you like, primordial energies from your unconscious. It's a bit like doing intensive therapy. There will be, you, you know, it's, it's always a good thing, but at some point you might hit 
some uh, you know some um, you know primordial deep energies which really stir you up but it's all part of the transformation journey and it's like that in Buddhism there's periods where it might be you might be stirred up but that's also part of the journey so anyway um, so the king invites Pamasamava uh, sends messengers, sorry, to invite Parmesanova, and they um, they find him in a cremation grounds because uh, that's where he's been exiled. He's been exiled to the cremation grounds. And uh, as tradition goes, when you want to invite, uh, you know, a teacher, you have to give them a gift. And so the king's giving the messengers a lot of gold dust, uh, lots and lots of gold powder, I think it is. So the messengers. They uh, offer this to Panasamava uh, to, you know, hope to get him to come to Tibet to sort out the monastery for them. Uh, and so anyway, Panasamava receives the gift. And very strangely, he, um, he takes the gold powder and he throws it to the wind like that. And he looks at the messengers and he says, um, you know, the whole world is gold to me. The whole world is gold to me. It's a very, very enigmatic thing to do. You know, most of us, if we were given quite a bit of gold, we'd be quite happy about it, wouldn't we? We'd be like, top, you know? And mm -hmm. we'd be like, my lucky day. Pamisama does the opposite, throws it to the wind. And this is, a, this is sort of showing that Pamisama's unconventionality is unpredictability, but also he's communicating a really deep truth. He can't be bargained for. We're often always trying to bargain on... You know, if I give Pamisamva this gold, he'll do what I want. He's showing that he's not going to be bought. He's not going to be bargained for. He does go to Tibet, uh, but he's beyond the convention of the ego, if you like, that's always kind of trying to buy or bargain things to happen. Um, and he's also showing that his enlightenment experience is one of incredible abundance. The whole world is gold to me. He's, he's got the inner riches of the waking mind. Uh, in a way, the, uh, norm, ordinary gold is sort of, he's, he's almost saying it's kind of meaningless to him, you know. Fascinating. So anyway, Pamisamava uh, is, accepts the invitation and he goes to, he goes, he, he agrees to go to Tibet, but he doesn't go to the palace where the king is. That's interesting. He, he goes to all the places in the country of Tibet where the demons are, the spirits that are not um, allowing the building of the monastery, this symbol, if you like, of meaning and transformation. Actually, Pamisamva goes to a cave. Um, so although in the story he goes round, it seems like he goes round Tibet and tames all these demons and there's chapters and chapters of him seeing all these different demons and transforming them. In reality, he goes to a cave which is in just outside Kathmandu uh, in a town called Parping. I've been there, that's why I'm mentioning it. I think Sundra might have been there as well, yeah. And... Um, he actually goes to this cave in Parping, it's called the Asura Cave. It's a pilgrimage point, and to Tibetans it's, it's as important as uh, Bogai almost, which is where the Buddha gained enlightenment. And he goes into deep meditation on a deity, which is quite interesting, which holds this. This is a, not a very good one, because I've got it on Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a kind of a depiction of a demon dagger called the Purba in Tibetan Buddhism. You'll see them on films about Tibetan Buddhism. You might have seen it on, you know, some of these uh, Dalai Lama films, you know, and where they have it. It's a ritual implement. And uh, Amachandra talked about the Vajra. That's the middle bit here as being a symbol of the of enlightenment. But then we've got this interesting kind of dagger that comes out here. It's actually a kind of crocodile, uh, an Indian mythic crocodile called the Makara. And out of the mouth of the crocodile, you probably can't see it because it's quite small, is a, is a kind of dagger that gets spewed out. And this is uh, the, what, what is used to pin down the demons you know, and get a good look at them. So the Makara is interesting, a crocodile, because that suggests to me um, the primordial depths. Yeah? 
that kind of um, energy of the primordial depth. It's a little bit threatening to the ego, our conscious mind, you know, and so we tend to push it away. But it is part of, it's part of the depths, yeah. And this is used by Padmasambhava to, when he, see, when he finds a demon, he's, you read about this in the life and liberation, he pins it down. And uh, when he holds it down, he can then have a good look at it. And when he has a good look at it, he can then uh, find its name. You know, and this in magical cultures, when you know some, something's name, you then have, as it were, control over it. You can tame it. And that's what he does with his purba in the Asura cave in Parping outside Kathmandu. Uh, he does that for all the, uh, the obstructing forces that are preventing the building of the monastery. So he goes to the places, in other words, where the mess is, and we have to do that uh, with our own minds. We have to go where the mess is, yeah, we have to uh, be willing to uh, look at the mess. And we all know what our messes are. We don't like to talk about them very much, although some people do. But, um, um, you know, generally, we're not very comfortable talking about our messes, you know. Um, but it's important uh, to do that. This is what the, um, the story is telling us, is that um, if we want to transform ourselves to the deepest levels, we have to be willing to look at our own demons. We have to be looking... We have to be willing to look at our own messes, yeah. But we can do that through using the purba. Now, what is the purba? The purba is actually your spiritual practice. This is a metal version of it. It's a weapon in a certain sense, but it's actually forged psychically. It's actually your mind, this purba. It's your mind, all the meta bhavana that you do, all the mindfulness of breathing you do, all the retreats you've been on, going deeper, all the precepts you've been following to transform your mind ethically, that's what forges your mind into a purba. That's what allows you to see your own, you know, your own demons as it were, and allows you to hold them and look at their true nature because these parts of us are quite unconscious a lot of the time, uh, most of the time, and they shapeshift, don't they? We can't quite get a hold of them but uh, with, uh, with, if you like, developing our mind through practice, we, we create our own psychic purba, we create our own magical dagger to have a look more closely at these uh, unconscious forces uh, within us. And we kind of know what that's like. You know, sometimes you, you, you have difficulties with some people in the family or some friends and you're trying to work it out and you're, you're talking, you're communicating, but you just can't get to it. Something goes wrong. Uh, you see it a lot with divorce, don't you, or difficulties in relationships. You know, you're trying, both are trying their best to, to be in harmony, to, to get on with each other, but something unconscious just keeps uh, making it difficult. Uh, that's the kind of territory we're, tra we're talking about, really. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, another, another area just to be aware of is... Um, uh, I, I know Amachandra mentioned it last week, was the demon-slaying mudra, which Padmasambha has seen with his vajra in his right hand on the image. Um, We've got to be careful with that language because in a way we don't slay the demons. Um, uh, if you know your Greek myths, I remember I was really into Jason and the Argonauts when I was younger. I think there was a film made about it. I remember the scene, if I remember rightly, where he's fighting this hydra, a strange kind of monster, and he cuts off the head of the hydra with his sword. As soon as he does that, seven more hydra heads grow in its place. Do you remember that one? It's kind of quite a famous scene. And, uh, you know, the, that's, that's what we've got to be aware of. We're not trying to destroy our own demons um, because we'll just <coughs> actually give them more energy. They'll become even more powerful. We're trying to um, see the true nature. We're trying to transform them. Um, so yeah, it's important to be aware of that really, yeah, yeah. Another, uh, an image from um, 
I think it's Roman mythology that comes to mind in this area is um, the god Saturn. Yeah, the god Saturn is associated in ancient Rome with depression, melancholy, and kind of descending. And of course, melancholy and depression is quite a big thing in the West, isn't it? You know, we millions of people suffer from it. My my brothers suffered from it. My dad suffered from it. I had periods of of it myself at times. Um, it's a big, a big, big thing uh, in, in our culture. And um, the Romans had a, a, a god for it called Saturn. And he was said to have these dark waters. Um, they were called Saturn's dark waters. Uh, but they said if you put your hands into the dark waters deeply enough, you will find gold coins at the bottom. And, and so in other words, in our darkest experiences, most difficult experiences, there's wealth. It's a very kind of alchemical truth that, uh, you know, in, in Saturn's dark waters, there are the gold coins of wealth. And I always think that's worth bearing in mind with our difficulty. Sometimes we can approach our difficulties with, if you like, a too, too much of a solar awareness. We try to analyse it, we try to fix it, we try to heroically overcome it. Um, but sometimes we need to have what you might call a lunar approach to our difficulties. And by that I mean um, we, have to, we have to be more intuitive in relationship to it. We have to look for the hints of what it's trying to communicate and what its needs are. Um, we have to be comfortable with the uncertainty that allowing this darker part of ourselves into our awareness might bring up. And we have to trust something deeper that something will emerge that will tr that will allow us to see the gold, the wealth that are in these dark waters. Yeah, it's a bit like um, I don't know if you remember Star Wars and um, Luke Skywalker's blindfold and he's training to be a you know a Jedi, and he's not allowed to really see what he's doing. Obi Wan Kenobi sort of saying to him use the force yeah so what it seems like he's not allowed to use his visual daylight consciousness he's having to use his intuition his feeling his uh, another sense altogether it's a bit like a kind of um, a more lunar sense if you like uh, and i think that that those sort of uh, metaphors are really important in spiritual life sometimes we need to use a more lunar touch and not always approach the difficulties with a solar approach, yeah. So our demons, uh, our darkness can be turned into gifts with the right approach. And this can take time. These, uh, you know, the, this is slow, slow work sometimes. It can take years of, uh, of being with us, being with our difficulties. It's not necessarily going to get fixed overnight. So eventually the uh, Panasan was able to build the monastery and um, having transformed the demons of Tibet, he then goes to the court where the king is to meet the king. It's quite a famous uh, sort of situation this in the story because um, the king's kind of expecting Panasanva to bow to him because that's the rules of the court, isn't it? But Pamisanva is not going to bow because he feels the king should bow to Pamisanva because Pamisanva is in a way higher than the king because he's awakened, he's enlightened. And there's a really awkward standoff, if you like, between the king and Pamisanva. And it's a bit tense and all the courtiers are, are all there and they're all shuffling, wondering what's going to happen. But the king's quite proud and he doesn't want to bow. But if uh, Buddhism's really going to take root in Tibet, the king has to recognise that the Dharma symbolised by Pamisamava is higher than him and his courts. And um, it's a bit like what is of most meaning and value. You know, is it status? <coughs> is it uh, prestige? Is it money and wealth? Is it being able to give your opinions? Is it high-minded uh, idealism? These are all symbols, if you like, of the king and the court. 
But Padmasambhava is about truth. He's about the truth of the Dharma. And at one point in the story, he just points his finger like this and a flame comes out of his finger. Everyone in the court's clothes suddenly get burned off uh, and they're all naked, uh, completely lost their clothes, naked. So it's a bit like they've lost their worldly uh, roles, their worldly status, and they have to just be with Padmasambhava uh, completely stripped of all that worldly ego base, you could say, um, uh, kind of uh, approach to things. And this is what Padmasambhava demands of us in our spiritual life. If you think back to Bhante and his uh, very enigmatic, direct experience of Padmasambhava, and we think of what Bhante has brought into the movement in Sri Ratna, but that kind of quality of communication very direct, very honest, very real. Uh, we can't have Sangha without real communication. This is what Padmasambhava is basically saying to the court in Tibet. If you want to have the monastery, if you want to have a place of meaning and value, then you have to have real communication. And that means you have to be individuals. You can't be roles. You can't be kings and courtiers hiding behind the roles. You have to be completely yourself. And in a way, that's one of the strongest messages of Padmasambhava, is about being completely yourself with the Dharma transformed. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I'm kind of running out of time. I would like to go on a bit longer, but I think I better not. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, and hopefully some of these reflections <coughs> on the mysterious symbolic life story Padmasamava might percolate into your own spiritual life. Um, he's not everyone's cup of tea, Padmasamava, has to be said, but you know uh, he's, a, he's definitely in the atmosphere of Tree Ratna. I know there's a lot of different ways into the spiritual life. And maybe Padmasamava is not your way at the moment, but he might, he might speak to you in the future. I sometimes find Padmasamava has come in, and, come in and out of my life depending on what's been going on. So uh, I'm hopefully giving you an introduction if you're not familiar with Padmasamva so you can start to make a relationship with this profound spiritual figure which permeates our Sangha and Sri Ratna. Mm.